The rushed and experimental COVID vaccine was first jabbed into arms in December of 2020. It was the Pfizer vaccine, which required two doses separated by three weeks to be effective. It was touted as the end-all, be-all of vaccines, a lifesaver, a must, a tool so safe and effective against COVID, it was forced on Americans and required to so much as eat indoors instead of outside like a dog. Two doses were supposed to do the trick, then it was two plus a booster, then another booster, and so on and so forth. Well, you remember. A lot of indications right now that uh, are telling us that there is uh, uh, a protection against uh, transmission of the disease. There is no variant that we have identified that escapes the protection of our vaccine. Against COVID to come now with a treatment of 90% effectiveness, you know, personally makes me a lot very proud about uh, And we know that um, the, three, the two doses of the vaccine offer very limited protection, if any. The three doses with a booster, they offer reasonable protection. Again, it is necessary a fourth boost right now. The, the protection that you are getting from the third, it is uh, good enough, actually quite good for hospitalizations and deaths. It's not that good against infections, but doesn't last. That was Pfizer CEO Albert Borla in a sequence of mental gymnastics routines and an ever-changing story that smelled then and certainly smells now like a load of hot BS. But mainstream media journalists have yet to really grill the man, have yet to really hold his feet to the fire. Well, fine, step aside. This team of independent rebel journalists will do it for you. Mr. Borla, can I ask you, when did you know that the vaccines didn't stop transmission? How long did you know that without saying it publicly? Thank you very much. I'm sorry. To that question. I mean, we, we now know that the vaccines didn't stop transmission, but why did you keep it secret? You said it was 100% effective, then 90%, then 80%, then 70%. But we now know that the vaccines do not trans stop transmission. Why did you keep that secret? Finally, someone had the balls to do it right there on the streets of Davos outside of the One World Order cult meetings separately titled the World Economic Forum. Hold that man accountable. Sue that company and others like it for everything they're worth. Get rid of these immunity protections Big Pharma operates under. Find out which politicians on both sides of the aisle are getting pharma kickbacks. Someone has to answer for this. And not for my benefit either. I'm un-COVID vaccinated and proudly. I don't have a dog in this fight other than not wanting to see my fellow Americans suffer from vaccine side effects in taboo silence or drop dead suddenly. The White House is still pushing boosters. City and state health departments are still running COVID vaccine propaganda ads on a daily basis. And in Connecticut, they're poised to wipe away parental consent for vaccines for children 12 and older. Liberals, I know you live and die, no pun intended, by whatever gospel the Democrats force feed you, but come on. This isn't about left versus right, it's about public health and getting answers. I thought y'all were about standing up to the man. Well, that man would be a good start and him next. Hug trees, eat bugs, dye your hair green and pink, plaster rainbows and black squares till your heart's content. But going along with this vaccine narrative isn't the hill you want to die on, quite literally. This is enough of this. The COVID vax mafia needs to be dismantled and now. The porn industry is worth an estimated $97 billion globally. It gets more views on any given day than Netflix, Amazon Video, and Hulu combined. And my next guest knows it all too well. He spent much of his adult life in the industry. He was the guy, so to speak. That was until he decided to give it all up to pursue a holier purpose. Joining me now is Pastor Joshua Broom. All right, Pastor Josh, this is one of the most interesting stories I have heard to date. So I, first I want to go back. Before you entered, you know, this holier purpose, I want to go back to the porn days. I want to yeah. know what possesses someone to want to get into the porn industry. Yeah, so for me, uh, my intention was never to pursue it. I never had any interest, uh, interest in being in the industry. I moved to Hollywood, and I was modeling and acting, and I was doing okay, but a group of girls approached me and they said, Hey, uh, can we introduce you to our agent? And I had a meeting with that agent and he essentially offered me everything that I was out there for fame, fortune, notoriety. And I said yes to that. How many years were you in that industry? A little over six years. So over six years, I did, you know, a little bit over a thousand movies, uh, got, 
around 18 different nominations, one performer of the year once, eclipsed a, about a million dollars in earnings. Wow. Okay, so I went to school in Las Vegas. So I remember when they had these awards because I, st I believe they still do them in Las Vegas. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so the yeah. porn industry is very popular in Las Vegas, if you can imagine that. I'm sure you know that very well. But it's amazing to me that you can be in the industry for that many years. You can make that much money. I mean, I'm sure it's incredibly intriguing. You said you made probably about a, a million dollars cumulative. Yeah, but for me, like, that was somewhat of an of, uh, anomaly because for guys, that's not, you know, it's, it's not the norm or for anyone because – I was at the top tier of that industry. So I was in the health and fitness space for a long time. So some personal trainers make a very good living, some scrape by. So it's just dependent on how successful you are, however you know good you are at your trade, how much uh, work you can get. And the porn industry is very much like that. So I'm very intrigued by this. How do you become a top tier porn star at the top of your game, at the top of your industry? What does that really mean? Yeah, just for me... Um, in the industry, because I got I got out of the industry ten years ago, and what was really popular when I was in the industry was parodying movies. So you know, I played Han Solo and you know Star Wars, and and you know, think of any big movie over the last twenty years, and they would take it, um, you know, ma make as close as they could of that same movie without getting sued, and I played the lead in a lot of those movies. So. That was the the thing that really catapulted me to the top of the industry. So it's acting, but with a twist, obviously. So I have to know, right. when you're in that kind of an industry, what is it like to have a relationship in that industry? What is your, your friends and your family, what do they think about the work that you're doing? It, that's got to be a difficult conversation to discuss with anybody who, who doesn't know that you're doing it, why you're doing it, how long you've been doing it. That whole thing has got to be difficult to discuss. Yeah, I mean, that's such a very deep question because, number one, I didn't tell anyone that I was doing it. And once they found out they did regarding my family, once my family found out I was doing it, my mom was really upset about that because I had went out to Hollywood to pursue acting and modeling. And my story is very different than a lot of people because I didn't need money. I didn't need anything. There's no reason for me to say yes to that industry. So they were shocked because... I really gave up everything I tried to go out there to obtain, and it really quickly blew up in my face because as soon as I did one of those movies, my mainstream agents like, "Hey, you you breached a code of conduct in your in your contract. You're out." So all of a sudden, I'm essentially blackballed from the mainstream industry, and I'm finding myself saying, "Okay, no, well now what do I do?" And I didn't listen to the, the voices in my life that were saying, hey, uh, e even though you messed up this opportunity, you're so much better than doing that. You're, you're talented. You're smart. There's other things that you can do. So the lie that a lot of people believe when they make a mistake is they have to stay where they are. You know, you have to play with the cards you've been dealt. But the reality is I could have had, you know, just some, you know, some some perseverance, some fortitude and said, hey, OK. I have to pivot and do something else. So I didn't do that. And then relationships within the industry, it's so sad because someone, so as a guy working in the industry that I work a lot, you're in a relationship with someone in the industry because the probability of someone dating you outside of that industry is incredibly low. Um, and then you're in a relationship with someone in that industry and you're both selling yourself for sex. So you're essentially both prostitutes and then you're going out, hanging out with you know, people who are your friends and your friends are probably also in the industry and you're you're finding yourself sitting across the table from, you know, a friend that you have. You had sex with his girlfriend last week and he had sex with your girlfriend today and you're pretending you're both in monogamous relationships and you're just it's so sad because you really believe these things. You say it's it's just work. It's not a big deal. This is just what I do. You know, we, you, you leave all that stuff on set. It doesn't really impact your real life. And you, you end up call, creating this plausible reality that is constructed by guilt and shame. And you don't even know who you are at the end of the day. And that's why the mental and emotional trauma is so impactful on the people in it. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion because porn is popular. It's always been popular. You know, porn is really innovative. Any new technology or, or anything has really come from innovation by how to view porn and how to disseminate porn to more people. I mean, it's widely viewed. And in fact, 
Porn is most widely viewed in Salt Lake City, Utah, of all places. I think people would be shocked to find that out. Well, it doesn't shock me at all. But that industry is so different. And the discussion of porn is so different because you've got one side, people saying that it's empowerment, and then you've got another side saying that it, it really isn't empowerment at all. It's actually exploitive. And I don't know where most people fall because it's not one of those things that's got a, a clear-cut left versus right, feminist versus toxic masculinity. I mean, there's people all over the board that have different views and conceptions of porn. But now that you've transitioned, now that you're a pastor, now that you've dedicated your life to to Christ and to the gospel, how do you yeah. view the industry? Do you view it as something that's dirty or do you, you view it as something that's for others and maybe just not yourself anymore? Yeah, I mean, something that I would love to make clear and something that's really important when I have these conversations with people is that I didn't leave the industry to pursue ministry. There was two years, there was, there was a two year gap between the time I left the industry until the time I became a Christian. So I left the industry because it was toxic. I left the industry because my mental health had suffered to the point where I wanted to take my life. I had saw the people around me, 30 people over the last 10 years have taken their life due to overdose or suicide. That is the, I mean, if you look at the industry in itself, the death rate for like people putting themselves in situations where they are killed or they're taking their own life is astronomical. So I would say this, and, and this is the way that I would start any talk like that, is each and every person deserving of human dignity? Most people would say yes. And then I would say, well, can you buy someone's dignity? Because that's what you're doing. And to your point, you know, pornography has been at the very forefront of the IT industry. They really set a, a model that you see on YouTube and every other social media platform because monetization from views is how the porn industry exists. So if you are consuming pornography, you are contributing to the industry because it exists and it is funded by viewership. It is monetized through viewership. There's no ads that are being ran on those pages unless it's being monetized through the viewership. So um, to your point, yeah, it's if you believe that people have human dignity, then you are robbing them of that when you consume porn. Because what you're saying is that person is a product and that product is is, you know, it's it's up for sale. And are you willing to sell yourself? Is that empowering or are you relinquishing the power? Are you relinquishing the very thing that makes you a human being, your dignity? So you're giving that away. So I would say it's actually the opposite of empowerment. Yeah, you know, you make a good point, but there are many individuals out there, you know, like yourself and others, most notably a very famous Kardashian who really got their start, maybe not from the porn industry, but from porn <clears throat> itself. I mean, you look at Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton. I mean, the list goes on and on. And they've been able to make monster careers by starting in that industry, whether they did it knowingly or not, that's up for discussion. But I wonder, is porn in your mind, is it dangerous? We know that there's a lack of dignity involved. It's the selling of bodies. It's the selling of sex. But is it in and of itself for the viewers? Do you think it's a dangerous concept? A hundred percent, because, I mean, if if you look at what porn does to society, it's astronomically destructive because what it's doing it, over 80 percent of porn videos have violence depicted within those videos and what you're seeing is you know the church or you know the world at large they're not having these tough conversations about sex in their homes and then people are are, are seeing uh this example of what sex is supposed to be and then they're going on dates expecting, well, I'm supposed to walk into a room and have sex with someone. Or if I take someone on a date, um, they owe me sex. So what you're seeing is people are viewing the, the you know, they're viewing pornography as real intimacy, as real interactions, and they're believing it to be true. And then they're going out and acting out these things. And that's, you know, it's contributing to rape culture, it's contributing to sex trafficking, it's contributing to all these things that are impacting real life. So I think it's so crazy that you you can just watch something over and over again and believe that it's not going to affect your, your mind. It's not going to affect your heart. It's not going to impact the way that you see the world because it just is. 
Right now, there's been a big discussion about pedophilia and grooming. It's kind of coming to the forefront, something that's been around probably since the dawn of time, but at least now it seems like people are more aware of it and people are sounding the alarm. Curious, Josh, in your time in the industry, did you ever see hints or notes of that? Child exploitation, pedophilia, or even something that was like feigned pedophilia? Is that something that you witnessed being in that industry for so many years? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, so there, there's the most popular types of pornography is barely legal. But if you put a girl in in tube socks or stockings and pigtails, are you trying to depict the 18 year old? No, you're not. And then at the same time, there's time after time after time, there's literally multiple sites, multiple companies in their genre, their niche is girls turning 18 and they're on their 18th birthday. They do these movies. So my question is, how did those girls get there? What communication led up and how long was that communication going until they ended up on that set? Six months, a year, two years. And then if you if you talk to some of the people um, that I know that have come out of that industry, they were they were starting to be exploited in that way at 12, 13, 14 years old. So it's a clear depiction of what, what you're talking about. It's it's crystal clear because the image, the fantasy that they're, they're trying to create, that's not an 18-year-old by any means, because what 18-year-old is dressing in pigtails and stockings? Right. Yeah, you know, you make a very good point about that. And I think that there are probably so many stories out there, people that don't have the same story as you, where you left the industry and then you started to produce, pursue something so much different. So let's talk about that now. Now you're, you're a pastor, you're pursuing Christianity, you found God. In what way does your past career contribute to what you're doing now? And in what ways is it, is it helpful for you to connect with people? Yeah, I mean, I think through just being really vulnerable and transparent, in that, you know, I believed, so I grew up without, you know, having a dad and that led me to believe that I need to prove myself in some way. And I think so many people can, can relate to that where you need to validate yourself through, you know, making the grades or making, you know, the team or making the shot or, um, you know, getting enough followers, whatever it is that you try to do to make yourself feel good about yourself. And I thought if I became famous, I would, you know, that would fill that void ahead in my heart. I became famous. I thought if I made enough money, then the the feeling of not being important would go away. You know, I made the money. I, I did all the things. I traveled all over the world. I did all the stuff. And what I found was that there was nothing that I could obtain on my own that would fix my heart. And it, and it, it to my detriment. So I was in that industry to the point I wanted to take my life. I had this wild interaction with a bank teller that did something as simple as looking me in the eye, saying my name and asking me if I was OK. And it just made me feel human for a moment. I leave the industry and there was two years where I was running, deleting my social media, covered up tattoos, shaved my head, tried to do everything I could to cover up my past. And then I met this girl and I said, hey, um, I want you to know how bad I am. And she's like, well, I want you to know that a person's not defined by the worst thing they've ever done. A person's not defined by the greatest thing they've ever done. I believe that God defines who a person is. And that person invited me to church and I went to church and I heard the truth that is found in the gospel. And that person has been my wife for the last six years. We'll be married seven years this year. We have three um, son, so four, two, and one. And my life has been progressively, it wasn't instantaneously changed, but it's been progressively changed. And the things that I am passionate about, you know, have changed. The things that, um, the way that I live my life has changed. But to your point, um, it, like you were saying with Paris Hilton and a few other people, yes, my experiences in my life led me to where I am now. You know, I, I have a book that's coming out that, you know, I, I'm working on this this massive uh, journalistic style podcast called Unmentionable that's coming out in April. And I wouldn't be doing any of those things if I didn't have that experience. But in life, we have the opportunity to fail forward. And if we fall forward while learning something and taking the good and leaving the bad, we can go much faster. So by no means am I saying uh, you should fail in the way that I have. But at the same time, my life is dedicated to saying this. 
regardless of what happened to you or regardless of what mistake that you made, that doesn't have to define what you do next. Your mistakes can be a launching pad to your purpose. And that is my story. It's an amazing story. And I'm really excited to see what you do with it because, you know, you've got the hook there of people being very interested in your previous industry and your current yeah. industry and being able to tie it all together. But it's a powerful message. Thank you for being brave enough and bold enough to share it because I'm sure a lot of people don't talk about it. And uh, I'm really intrigued and fascinated by all of it. I'm really excited to see your book and see all the success, success that you have. Thanks so much, uh, Pastor Josh, for being with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. God bless you.